The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 5 The Old Crawford Mill, that's what Luda May had called it. That was her name for this, this, how could you describe it? Their first thought was that they'd come to the wrong place. This couldn't be where the sheriff planned to meet them. But then they went over all the directions Luda May had given Aaron, and this was the only place that fit. But look at it. As he parked the van, Kemper could see a skeletal mess of angular wooden structures, rotting, dilapidated, lost, defiant, unnerving. A farmstead painted in scabs by Hieronymus Bosch, using a cold steel nail gun as his brush. There were sloping roofs, rusty iron sheets, broken windows, coils of degraded barbed wire, bits of broken furniture, more discarded auto parts, Lashed partitions, collapsing screens, old empty oil drums and junk. The whole place was overgrown with greenery. The main building used to be a cotton mill, a classic two-level gin house. The cotton gin was a revolutionary piece of engineering in its day, but now its wheels and gears were a symbol of a long-dead past. In just the same way, this mill was also long-dead. Contrary to what the five of them had expected to find, the old mill was abandoned, how long ago, it was impossible to tell. There was no way that someone could still be living here, and yet, the area wasn't completely free from signs of recent human activity. Far from it. The entrance to the mill had been decorated with damned weird ornaments. At first glance, the objects resembled Native American art, but when the kids got out of the van, they could see that this was no display of folk culture. No, what they were looking at was a form of bastard mechanical surgery. Animal skulls nailed on the walls and on tall wooden posts. The white bones disfigured with mutated auto parts. A plastic baby doll grafted onto the skull of a cow. The sharp curved horns taking the place of her smiling arms. Her little dress was pulled up to reveal faux genitalia as if to grind her distorted abusive sexuality into your face. There seemed to be no clear point where the broken machinery ended and the decomposed animal remains began. It was a blurring of dark possibilities. And someone had spent time doing all of this. Someone had deliberately sat down, broken stuff, then stuck it together again in all the wrong ways, making these foul ornaments, fusing the known into new and revolting forms of the unknown. This was art as pain, art as dismemberment, and art as abomination and the mind that got pleasure from creating this barbaric junk was either a tortured artist or a deranged lunatic. No wonder there's a law against relatives marrying each other. It was Morgan who'd finally broken the silence. He had reached the outside of the mill and could now see that the walls were covered in crude, obscene drawings, and somebody had scribbled vile writing on the splintered boards. Wrong words jammed together to produce the same disturbing effect as the doll's plastic cunt bolted tightly in between the horns of the dead cow's skull. Morgan couldn't believe this place. It was way too scary. But then their whole journey had been like this. First they met the girl and, well, she killed herself. Then Luda May, the beef in their fight with her. And now the old woman had sent them on this journey, deeper and deeper into the countryside, until finally, now Morgan knew how Charlie Marlowe must have felt. He'd read Heart of Darkness in class, but he'd never really understood it before. This was the first time he'd considered Africa and Texas in the same breath. But then Marlowe was a fictional character. 
whatever was going on here was real. Most of the other kids were just as freaked out. It was one thing to drive out to an old abandoned mill, but totally another to discover a shitload of stuff that looked like it had been put together by a tribe of automotive cannibals. Slowly, they spread out, each taking a closer look at whichever artifacts were most disturbing to them. If this was an art of some kind, then what? Ain't no sheriff here, said Kemper. He'd taken in all the weird trash in no time at all, and frankly, it didn't bother him. What did bother him was that they'd come all the way out here, like Luda May said, and there was no patrol car and no damn sheriff, only a bunch of retarded junk. Morgan was quick to agree, and he was prepared to go one forbidden step further. I say we dump her and get the hell out of here. The mill was freaking him out. All the weird stuff written on the walls, the skulls, nails hammered all over the place, barbed wire, a broken lantern, chains welded together, the animal bones. He'd even found a pair of women's shoes, and there were just too many damn shadows. None of them told Morgan to shut up, but then none of them made a move to enter the mill either. The doorway was open. Heck, there was no door, and they could see an old armchair just inside, but no one went in. No one called out. Hey, Mr. Crawford, we're here to see the sheriff. Everyone stayed clear of the dark open rectangle leading into the building, and they couldn't see a thing through the broken windows. Kemper looked across at Aaron. Fact is, Kemper liked Morgan's idea. He liked it a lot. Sure, he knew it was wrong, but they'd really gone out on a limb for the dead girl, and it was getting them nowhere. And now they were in redneck hell. Old Sonny was probably going to show any second with a shotgun. Seriously, Kemper was ready to ditch the body and run, but he knew how popular that would be with Aaron. God damn, why did she come on this trip? She hadn't joined in. All she did was put a damper on things. He couldn't do anything as long as she was around. Yeah, he looked and he could see that she was already waiting for him to say something. Suddenly, he got an idea. Maybe we should vote on it. Aaron was straight in his face. Kemper, no. Why not, Aaron? Whined Morgan, taking a step back towards the van. It's a damn democracy. She turned on him and asked him how the hell he would like to be dumped out there. Hey! He replied. Nobody asked her to blow our brains out in our van. Um, my van? Kemper corrected, which really helped things. Aaron needed support, but with that van comment, Kemper had made it clear he was going to sit on the fence. Fine. She looked round at Pepper. Andy. I say we dump her, said Andy. It was the highway all over again. Aaron and Pepper had wanted to pick the girl up, Andy and Morgan had wanted to leave her, and Kemper had sat on the fence thinking about his goddamn van. But Aaron admitted that's when everything had gone straight down the pan. The girl had shot herself. So would Pepper, even though the suicide had really got to her, back Aaron up a second time? Or would she take the easy way out? Aaron needn't have worried. As soon as Pepper heard Andy's decision, she called him out. Ah, pig. But Morgan wasn't finished yet. In fact, he was far from finished. He walked into the center of the group, rubbing a stressed hand through his thick black hair, and sang out. Cool. That's two votes. One more, and we're out of this cow town. Kemper? Oh, great. Kemper, the man. Kemper, the chauffeur. Kemper, always in the driving seat caught between the guys and the deep blue girlfriend. Everybody watched him, waiting for him to say something. He kept a poker face. The swing vote was his. Two wanted to stay, two wanted to go. He looked at Aaron, stern, resolute, hopeful. He looked at Morgan, scared, resolute, hopeful. Baby. He said finally, looking towards Aaron. She's dead. It won't matter where we leave her. Morgan could have leapt up and punched the flaming sky. When he saw Kemper look at Aaron like that, he thought it was game over. Kemper would look at her, clock the drippy expression on her face, and give in. Screw logic. Screw common sense. Just let his woman tell him what to do like he always did. But not this time. No way, man. Kemper had just shown his girl who's boss. They were going. They were out of here. But Aaron hadn't given up. What the hell was Kemper thinking? It didn't matter where they dumped the body. Well, it matters to me. She complained, but then softly, If that still means anything. 
bitch. Morgan could have killed her. She was playing the emotional blackmail card. Agree with everything I say or the relationship's screwed. What a bitch. Aaron. Kemper sighed. That girl's got parents out there that might want her back. Not dumped like some piece of trash. Kemper shook his head. He didn't want to say no to Aaron, but he couldn't agree. There was nothing about this situation he liked. The girl, the van, the weird old cotton place, nothing. He had to go with the guys on this one. He'd take the consequences when they got to Dallas, if she ever spoke to him again. And she would. They'd been going steady for over five years now, and you don't go that long without breaking a few eggs. She'd be pissed. She'd leave his calls a few weeks, and then they'd make up again. God damn it. They were in love. She couldn't break up over something as crazy as this. It wasn't as if it was any of them who shot the girl. No, Kemper had made up his mind. He'd cast his vote, and they were leaving. Straightening his baseball cap, Kemper turned and was about to make for the Dodge when Pepper said, Hey, what if that old lady got our plates? We could get in a lot of trouble. The old lady couldn't care less, said Andy scornfully. You heard her. What you do is your own business. Man, that's like gospel to these prairie billies. They both had a point. Luda May might have got their plates, or she might not. Likewise, Luda May might actually give a damn, or she might not. Kemper shrugged and continued on his way to the wagon. Discussion over. Morgan felt a surge of excitement. At long damn last, they were doing something positive. He didn't want to be stuck out here all day, waiting at the Norman Bates mill for some inbred cop to show up and go all psycho on their ass. And the heat and the humidity among these trees was unbearable. Well, screw everything, because finally, finally, they were leaving. Yes! Unnoticed by the others, Aaron was going through a tough internal battle. The decision Kemper had just made to leave was nothing compared to the decision Aaron was trying to make now. The whole business about the dead girl was important. The other guys were behaving as if the whole thing somehow wasn't real, but it was. They all had a major responsibility to do the right thing. Unfortunately, in 94 degrees, everyone seemed to be having trouble remembering what the right thing was. Aaron ran over to Kemper and grabbed him by his open denim shirt. She saw him pull that same old face. Fine. He didn't want any crap from her, okay. He could sigh as much as he wanted just as long as he came round the other side of the van with her, out of earshot of the others. Finally, she let him go. Why do you think I haven't got high this entire trip? She said quietly. Kemper looked any which way except at her face. I can't read your mind, Aaron. This was it. She had made her decision and was going to see it through. This wasn't quite how she'd imagined the scene in her mind, but the stakes were just too high. If Kemper dumped that dead girl's body and quit the scene, he'd be making the biggest mistake of his entire life. I'm pregnant, she said. He looked up. You're going to be a dad, Kemper. And suddenly, it all made sense to him. The way she felt sick, the way she didn't drink any booze down in Mexico or smoke any dope coming back, the way she got so angry over the piñata, why she was so worried about him being busted for bringing dope over the border. Kemper couldn't believe it. He was going to be a daddy. I'm not having our baby in prison, she said, and this time, the discussion was over. She turned to rejoin the others to let them know of Kemper's change of mind, but found Andy standing right behind her. He had a great big smile on his face, and the rest of them were peering around the corner of the van. They'd heard everything. So, congratulations are in order. Being to Andy, but he then saw the sour expression on Aaron's face. I guess...
They followed Aaron back round to the entrance of the mill. She sat down on some beat-up old wooden thing, and Morgan stood beside her, while Andy grabbed a chair next to the doorway. Kemper sat down on the porch steps. They looked charred, blackened, as if they'd been on fire. Pepper paced in between all four of them. She couldn't relax. The doorway was just an empty open frame leading to the dark, shadowy insides of the gin, and Pepper couldn't keep her eyes off it. Their conversation was mostly spent. They'd heard what Aaron had said. Kemper was going to be a dad, and that changed everything. Except for Morgan, who saw no reason why they couldn't just dump the dead girl and then worry about Aaron's child. The chances of any of them being arrested for this were practically nil. Pepper carried on pacing backwards and forwards, watching the entrance just in case. What was that? She saw something move. There, inside the mill. It was too dark to make out what it was, but someone or something definitely walked across the room just through the open doorway. It looked like a shadow walking in front of a black wall a silhouette flickering briefly in front of a crack of light that was shining beyond the door. Pepper started and stepped up to the open doorway. Her smooth, tender face was scrunched with concern and more than a little amount of fear. Everybody jumped. It was clear Pepper thought she'd seen something, and now she was straining to see inside, but... What? asked Andy. I just saw something. She said, pointing into the darkness. Morgan thought he'd seen it, too. Someone's in that fucking place! Bullshit, said Aaron. She knew Morgan would grab at the first chance to come up with some reason why they'd have to leave the place, and Pepper had probably just imagined it. Either way, nobody was leaving. I swear to God, said Morgan again. Something moved! Aaron was unimpressed. She realized she'd left her Stetson back in the van, but it would have to stay there. She didn't want anyone to get the wrong impression if she suddenly got up and walked away. The others were now standing bunched around the doorway, looking into the abandoned mill, trying to see what Pepper had seen. Only Aaron remained seated. You're just trying to scare me into leaving, she said, unimpressed. Aaron, cut in Kemper, his voice pleading for her to be reasonable. Go to hell, she replied. Then she got up and walked straight inside the mill. She moved before Kemper even had time to guess what she planned to do. Aaron, don't. He shouted, but it was no good. Aaron would show them there was nothing to be scared of. They just had to sit and wait for the sheriff to show. The ground floor of the mill was mixed in shadow. A few rays of light poked through a scattering of small holes in the ceiling, but all they did was cast just enough brilliance to show that the inside of the mill was a sewer of broken clutter and decay. Aaron took a cautious sniff. The air was damp and smelled of grave dust. As her eyes got used to the darkness, she began making sense of where she was. It was a large room. A hall of some kind. The walls seemed to be patched with torn sheets of paper. There was garbage all over the floor. There was dirt, chairs, and what looked like an old lampstand with a dead bird entangled around it. There was more of that crazy skull stuff like outside. The shadows seemed full of details Aaron really didn't want to see. Outside, Kemper waited for her to show. None of them were in any rush to follow her inside, not until they heard her scream. Immediately, Kemper grabbed hold of something from the ground, a rusted iron bar, then ran in through the open doorway. Andy was right alongside him with Pepper and Morgan following up back. Hey! shouted Kemper. Where are you? Hell, she was his girl and she had his baby. Where the hell was she? His eyes hadn't yet got used to the dark. He was practically blind. Kemper waited, but there was no response. Where was she? 
Suddenly, something moved, passing through a shaft of light over in the corner of the room. It was Aaron. She grinned slyly. Thought I saw a mouse. God damn it, Aaron. Kemper breathed out again and relaxed. She was just playing tricks on them. Despite everything, Morgan had to laugh. All the same, he was sure he'd seen something. He wasn't trying to scare Aaron the way she'd just reeled in all of them. And Pepper had definitely seen something. No matter what, Aaron, a noise came over from a corner of the large open room. Pepper gasped. It couldn't be Aaron this time. She was nowhere near the noise. None of them were. It was a shuffling sound, almost as if someone was crawling or stumbling around beneath the cover of the impenetrable shadow. All right, that's it, shouted Kemper, feeling just about ready to add another body to the van. If somebody's out there, just come on out. He raised the iron bar and held it tight. They took a guarded step over in the direction of the sound, and now they began to see something. The noise appeared to be coming from an old closet standing on the debris-strewn floor. Only the closet was partially sunken where the rotted wooden floorboards had given way. The five of them shuffled slowly toward the closet, Kemper in front with the iron bar. Even Aaron had to admit there was something going on, something she didn't like. The sound again. It was definitely coming from the sloping closet. Kemper gestured the others to stand back, then took the last couple of paces on his own. Slowly, weapons ready, he reached out and tentatively touched the handle of the closet door. The sound stopped. Kemper paused. Then he gently turned the handle and yanked the door wide open. Just as a shrieking possum leapt out of the closet and bolted hissing across the floor, straight out of the room. They almost had cardiac arrest there and then especially Kemper. But the moment they realized it was just a dumb animal, the whole gang heaved a sigh of relief and started to laugh. Kemper was feeling dumb. He'd been caught out by the oldest trick in the book. Lowering his makeshift weapon, he rubbed the back of his neck and suddenly realized he was staring face to face with someone in the darkness. Christ! Kemper jumped out of his skin, causing the other kids to scream out loud with him. This wasn't funny anymore. Their nerves were shot. But now all of them could see the small figure of a boy climbing off a hammock that was pushed up against the far wall, near to the sunken closet. Surely this wasn't the kid's home. As soon as he had both feet on the ground, the boy scurried away into the shadows and tried to hide, but Kemper could hear his scared, labored breathing. Who are you? Asked Kemper, sounding a little more angry than he meant to. What'd you do to her? Came a reply in the thin, reedy, broken voice. Kemper didn't know who the boy was talking about. Huh? Ya yeah, girl, came the voice again. Girl in the van, what did you do to her? The kid knew about the dead girl, but how the hell could he? The five of them had been set slam in front of the open doorway from the moment they'd arrived at the mill. There was no way the kid could have got out and seen the body without them noticing. But then, he must have, somehow. We didn't do anything to her, said Kemper cautiously. Aaron had been paying close attention to the boy's voice. It had a peculiar, distant quality to it. He seemed to be emphasizing his words in all the wrong places, as if he'd almost forgotten how to speak. Aaron couldn't quite tell where the kid was from, but judging by his accent, he sure as heck wasn't from Travis. She stepped forward to try and help Kemper. She did it to herself, Aaron said, and in her mind's eye she could clearly see the moment when the frightened teenage girl shot herself. There was a pause, and then the boy shuffled forward where they could see him. Oh my God. Aaron couldn't help it, it just escaped from her lips. The poor boy looked so hungry. No, he looked starved. His skin was all dirty and his hair was a wild mess of badly cut dark hair. But the strangest thing about the kid was that he seemed to have no eyebrows to speak of, making his face seem more cadaverous. But he was still just a kid. You promise you won't hurt me? He asked. Aaron could see he was frightened. Okay, when the kid first appeared, he'd scared the life out of the five of them. But now, 
Kemper was holding an iron bar and the kid was surrounded by strange faces of people much older and stronger than him. Something about the boy touched Aaron's heart. It might have been her prenatal hormones or it could have been the simple sight of this famished kid dressed in torn soiled clothing, lying in a bunk in the darkness of a ruined mill out in the heart of the Texan wilderness. God, if she ever found the boy's parents. Aaron held out her hand. At first, the boy didn't want to go, but then he took it and she led him outside into the light. It was long past noon by now, and the temperature had clawed its way even higher. Although the beleaguered friends were all soaked through to the skin with sweat, they preferred to sit back outside in the heat, rather than the dank shade of the mill. Aaron sat down beside the boy. She didn't know how the kid could bear to stay in the old ruin like that. The others, too, found the sight of the boy strangely intriguing. What the hell was he? A circus freak? Some kind of local birth defect? A runaway? Morgan was feeling quite himself again, now that they were no longer standing in the old dank house, jumping like jackrabbits at every tick and creak. How he saw it, their whole day was unfolding like a brother's grim fairy tale. Finding the dirty little spaz kid was just the next chapter. Morgan wanted to skip straight to the last page, where the five of them cleared out in Kemper's van and lived happily ever after. Pepper, on the other hand, felt like Aaron. The sight of the boy upset her, and she wanted to help him in any way she could. But she would have felt more comfortable if the kid didn't keep looking over at the blood-stained broken window at the back of the Dodge. As for Andy, Andy was just Andy. He had no interest in any of this right now. He'd made his feelings clear earlier, dump the body and go. He couldn't care less about the boy. Finding the boy made no difference. The only person Andy wanted to see right about now was the sheriff. It was the same with Kemper. That crazy old witch down at the store had told them to meet the sheriff at the old Crawford Mill. That's what she said, the old Crawford Mill. And she told Aaron how to get to the goddamn place. But the sheriff wasn't here, which meant either he hadn't arrived yet, or he'd already been and gone, or this wasn't Crawford Mill. Either way, Kemper guessed that the weird kid might have some of the answers. Raising the visor of his cap, Kemper looked down at the boy. Is this the Crawford Mill? The kid didn't reply. Instead, he turned to Aaron and said, I used to play here with my friend Billy, but he died. Pepper shook her head and started jigging her left leg. Why did everyone around here have to keep talking about death? And who put all those horrible animal skulls all over the place? Aaron tried asking the boy what his name was, but her question was about as successful as Kemper's. Was she mad? asked the boy. He was looking back in the direction of the van. Aaron didn't get it. All the boy seemed to want to talk about was the dead girl. Why? Was it just morbid curiosity or what? Yes. Aaron replied, She was real mad. They fell silent, the boy straining to see the suicide corpse. At least he was talking to them. That was something. My name's Aaron. She ventured. Jedediah? Came the reply, and he looked plainly into Aaron's face, his dull eyes watching her, her eyes, her mouth, her... Morgan found the boy's name just too much. He put his mouth close to Pepper's ear and whispered, Weren't you in the Beverly Hillbillies? The remark was, of course, aimed at Jedediah, who didn't seem to hear. But Pepper did, and she swiftly elbowed Morgan in the ribs. Aaron, too, shot him a dirty look before turning her attention to the boy again. He looked scared. I like your shirt. She smiled. Underneath his coarse jacket, Jedediah wore a Felix the Cat t-shirt. Felix was my favorite. She said, Who? Aaron pointed to the print of the cartoon cat on the front of the shirt. Felix the Cat, you know, with the bag of tricks. Jedediah considered this information for a moment, then corrected her. He don't have no name. Yeah, 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 all very cozy, all very happy families. Andy pushed forward and looked down at the boy. Listen, kid, he said. We're supposed to meet the sheriff here. Have you seen him? The boy raised his face to look up at Andy. Yeah, yeah? 
This caught everyone's notice. Kemper, in particular, was now eager to hear what the boy had to say. Where? Asked Aaron. Home? Get in drunk? Was the downright disappointing reply, and he was still staring mostly at the van. Cool, said Morgan decisively. He was totally fed up. Let's split. But Aaron hadn't finished. The boy could help them. Does he live around here? She queried, trying to find out everything Jedediah knew about the sheriff. The boy pointed somewhere off to the rear of the mill. Other side of that grove? They followed his finger in the direction of an ominous mass of trees and bushes. Can we drive from here? Kemper asked, even though the boy still hadn't made it clear whether or not they were actually at Crawford Mill. The road to go to the sheriff's, said Jedediah, but it's a pretty short walk. They looked again at the shambling groves the boy had indicated. None of them cared much for the idea of walking through there. The way ahead looked just like the house, thick with dark shadows, and all it seemed to do was lead deeper off into nowhere. Hadn't they already descended through enough layers of this Texan hell? When Morgan spoke up again, he was only saying what they were all thinking, besides Aaron. Hey, if the sheriff doesn't give a shit, why should we? Andy, Kemper, and Pepper mulled this over. All day long, Morgan had been the devil on their left shoulder, and Aaron had been the angel on their right. But they all wanted the same thing. They all wanted to get out of the hole they were in. They just weren't equipped to handle it. They just didn't know how. Look, man. Pushed Morgan. We just got splattered with brains. Our dope is gone. We're fucking around in this goddamn hick town. I'm not about to lose these Skinner tickets. So let's get out of here. It was tempting. God, it was tempting. Pepper looked at Andy. Of all the people here, she felt closest to him. She didn't know any of them properly, but she'd made love to Andy and he seemed like a real nice guy. And he didn't have to shout to make himself heard like the rest of them. Pepper reached a quiet decision that she would do whatever Andy did. Andy looked at Kemper. They'd been buddies since school and they'd been through a lot together. Fights, girls, cars, you name it. But it had always been clear who was the leader of the pack. Morgan and Andy were on the same level, but Kemper was the man. Andy trusted Kemper, and he'd do whatever his friend decided. So it was all on Kemper. The young mechanic in question had gone with Aaron when they'd first decided to pick up that insane girl, and look where that had landed them. But then he'd already gone with the guys on the marijuana issue, and he supposed they could have been busted, in theory. He'd also stuck with the guys when they'd originally decided to dump the body here. Sure, he knew they always expected him to give in to Aaron, but... That was just their horse shit. What really changed things now was knowing that he was going to be the father of Aaron's child. That one fact alone pushed the two of them closer together and made him feel the need to be more responsible. Aaron had been right all along, but Kemper had been sort of holding on to the past, to his youth. Now, however, it was time for him to quit fooling and become a man. Kemper watched his girl. He could tell Aaron was also waiting on his decision. He knew what she wanted him to do, and he respected her for not saying anything. This time, she was leaving him on his own, to make up his own mind. It wasn't a test. Things were too far gone for her to be playing games. No, this was real, and it was a mess. So, should he go find the sheriff's house or not? Kemper knelt down in front of the kid and said, How do I get there? Aaron smiled to herself. Kemper had made up his mind, and he'd made the right choice. He was going to find the sheriff, and Aaron was sure as hell going with him.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 5 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the, re the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Uh, a lot of stuff went down in this chapter. We're starting to meet more people from this town. Uh, we've all met Jedediah. I'm not exactly doing him like he is in the movie. I'm trying to represent Jedediah the way I'm seeing him represented in the book. May not be the best. I apologize if you don't like my uh, take on it. Um, God, those cars drive. I know you heard that. Uh, I have to stop so often when I'm recording because of uh, noises on the highway. I live right on a road. It's so irritating. Uh, anyways, a lot of stuff went down in the chapter. We got the revel ah, tongue tied here. We got the revelation that Aaron is pregnant. Uh, you know, Morgan, great job, Sean Campbell, uh, voicing Morgan, and uh, everybody who did the voices did a great job. Uh, but uh, I like how Morgan is like, you know, the stoner, but he's like the voice of reason here. Uh, out of the group of friends, he's the only person that's unfazed by the news. You know. Oh, yay, Aaron's having a baby. Awesome. Let's dump the dead woman out of the car and go. <laughs> you know, everybody else is, like, wanting to stick with it because of it. But, uh, you know, Morgan, I think we all know a Morgan uh, who, who in a situation would uh, probably be like that. At least I do. Uh, hell, I might be the Morgan. Because, I mean, just put yourself in that fucked up situation, you know. You're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the sheriff's not showed up. Uh, this little creepy kid is there. I don't know. If I was in this situation, I think my instinct would be what the guys were saying. Uh, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the dead and everything, but it's just too many too many red flags. Uh, maybe I'm too much of a survivalist. But then again, if they, if they had gone that route, there wouldn't be a movie. There wouldn't be a novelization. It would be quite boring. Uh, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna think too much about that, and, uh, but I am looking forward to what comes next, uh, the sheriff will be here soon, uh, you know, the deaths are coming, I cannot wait to see how Stephen Hand, uh, covers a lot of the main points in the movie, but, uh, things are about to get interesting. Uh, next chapter, I believe we meet another character that is being voiced by a patron, uh, so I'm looking forward to that, uh, to add another voice actor to this book. Uh, Liam Anderson is going to be voicing Monty, but everybody's doing a great job. Uh, there's a whole cast list in the description below, uh, the names of everybody who's voicing a character and the character they're voicing. I'm also looking forward to see how the sheriff plays out in this book, and if he's written as great as he was in the movie. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, R. Lee uh, Ermey, the actor who played the sheriff, probably improvised a bit. Uh, he was such a great actor. Uh, there's, he was just a living, breathing character actor, uh, and he was one of the greats, and it's sad that we lost him. Uh, everything he was in, uh, he, he brought it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, uh, his part. I'm gonna be voicing him, uh, I'm hoping I can, I can do at least half the job he did with the role. Uh, I know I cannot do a perfect Arlie Ermy impression. I'm gonna be doing it, uh, my own interpretation of the character in the book. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you guys thought of this chapter if you're looking forward to more. I'll be back as soon as possible with chapter 6. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and no, you know, this is like, what, the 6th upload? No more jump scares, no more of that stuff. <laughs>